He is, of course, a uh, star of stage, screen, television. And uh, I think you're about to find out he's got a new talent. He's an extraordinary writer. You're going to have a great time with his memoir, in spite of myself. He is uh, Canadian-born, classically trained, starred on Broadway in such Shakespeare plays as Othello, Macbeth, King Lear, as well as The Royal Hunt of the Sun, J.B., The Good Doctor, and Barrymore. His films include the epic Fall of the Roman Empire, Inside Daisy Clover, The Man Who Would Be King, Dolores Claiborne, The Insider, and of course, The Sound of Music. Yes. <laughs> he has two Tony Awards, two Emmys, and last month he was honored for his lifetime achievement by the Fort Lauderdale Film Festival. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Rippon. <laughs> Chris, uh, I think it's very telling what a person chooses as the first line of his autobiography. Yours begins, quote, I was brought up by an Airedale. <laughs> so, so let's begin there. Tell me a little bit about your canine upbringing. <laughs> yeah, I was. I didn't know, as I say in my book, I didn't know who that nice lady, tall lady was pushing my pram until about months later when someone said, that's your mother. I loved my, I, my youth in Montreal. It was, Montreal back then was a very exciting city because it had cabaret. It, was the same, it had the same amount of attention on the cabaret field as Las Vegas and New York and Chicago. And Montreal was huge because it had been French as well. It got everybody from France and everybody from Europe coming over, all the top nightclub people. So I watched... Uh, absolutely awestruck, nursing a beer on the bar, you know, every night watching young Frank Sinatra, young Judy Garland, Maurice Chevalier, Edith Piaf, Jacqueline Francois, you know, you get all these extraordinary, extraordinary talent. But in those early days, you sort of looked down on film acting. Yes. As you write in the book, I was a pampered, arrogant young bastard, spoiled by too many great theater roles. Yes. Would you say you still have a bias towards the stage? Yes, I think a bias towards the stage. Yes, I'm not, not quite stupid enough to think that films are de rigueur or, or beneath me. But don't forget, it was a kind of attitude that we all had in the, in the theater in the 50s. Because that was the superior medium. That was the original medium, the theater. And it, to me, it still is. I agree. That's where, all the, where you learn your craft where you meet all the challenges, where you perform the greatest words that have been written by man. And then you do follow the Roman Empire. And I remember there's one line, very few bits of dialogue in follow the Roman Empire. Thank God. But Stephen Boyd got the whole street locked up. It's the Appia Antica in Rome, and he comes down in a chariot. And the whole armies are on both sides of the with the shields up. There must be thousands of men. And he comes down at the end of the day, it's a long shot, and they're repairing, and the sun is going down behind the hills, and hurry up, he's supposed to get, reach the thing, Sophia Loren, supposed to get out of the chariot, he comes up to her, her name is Lucilla, Lucilla, and he says, Lucilla, <laughs> so they said cut they had to do it the next day <laughs> so the next day they set it up again and he was so nervous poor Stephen <clears throat> instead of saying Lucius has returned to Rome he got up his horse walked up to her with full confidence said Lucius is back in town <laughs> Thing much clearer than the attack. <laughs> I remember interviewing you down here when you came to Palm Beach to do the play Barrymore, and you were your charming self until I brought up a, a movie, The Sound of Music. Uh -huh. and you nearly bit my head off. Oh, I did? Yes. And you're going to dare to bring it up again. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, I understand you've had a love-hate relationship with this movie. 
<laughs> which refer to the book as S and M. Yes, I call it S and M. My favorite nickname you had for it once was the sound of mucus. <laughs> In any event, you seem to have mellowed about the film. You, you write that you saw it again last year by accident and uh, at an Easter party, and, and you think it's not a bad movie. Well, no, for, for what it was, I never thought it was a bad movie. But the press just loved anybody who was going to be irreverent about it, so they, they caught it on to me, and they said, hey, let's get that cynical old bastard. Because <laughs> I'm so sick of all those nuns. <laughs> There's a sort of reverence that drives you nuts on the set every day. So, of course, it was the easiest thing in the world to be okay. Peck's bad boy, you know. And uh, it was a dull part. I remember no. Captain Von Trapp. Oh, yes, a very dull part of it. We had to rewrite it because on, on the stage, in the stage production, Mary Martin had played, played it in New York, and Theodore Bickell had played Captain Von Trapp. Now, in the play, the musical, uh, Mary Martin comes on and sings 16 songs. <laughs> Baron Von Trapp come, makes an occasional entrance. And just as he's about to speak, Mary Martin sings another 16. <laughs> so I thought, you think that we could improve the role just a slightly and make them a little bit more equal? I mean, come on, it's supposed to be a love story. So, so uh, Ernie Lemon, who was a smashing writer, and one of the best screenwriters in Hollywood, I wouldn't have, I, I didn't envy his challenge on this one. He, he did improve the role. But somebody told me one day, he said, you know, if you go up in the fields above Salzburg, you will meet uh, Hans, who is uh, the nephew of Captain Fontaine. Why don't you ask him about your character? So I went up. He was obviously a stonemason or something. He was building a wall. And I took my interpreter with me. And I said, uh, I'm sorry to bore you about this, Hans, but you knew your uncle, obviously. But wh what was he like? Give me some Give me some help. There's a long pause, and he says something in German. And the interpreter turned to me and said, said he was the biggest bore he ever met. <laughs> Good as time as any to talk a bit about uh, your feelings and the importance of saving theaters uh, yeah. in general, of course, and the Royal Poinciana Playhouse in specific in the Records Ball. Yeah, I find it extraordinary that we've gone as far as getting this landmark back, and then they're still screwing around. I mean, I find that absolutely incredible because Palm Beach has always been very loyal to its theater. And uh, I've been an audience here many times. I've played here three times, Barrymore, uh, Othello, and then a play with, by Garson Kenan called Peccadillo. And we had wonderful audiences. And God, it was a great stuff, you know, plays being on their way to New York, tryout productions going, and then proper musicals. And it's an ideal little theater. And to have this happen is and all the generosity and the money that's been poured into trying to save it seems to go for naught. Um, because part we, every little community does need a theater. It really does. Because the theater tells you who you are, you know, and um, what you can achieve. And that's the purpose of a, of a, of a playhouse when the writing can inspire you and, and lift you to a sublime moment. But, uh, and it's also a hell of a place to be <laughs> and show off. <laughs> and it's such a shame. I, I just hope that we can save, save it. Because I remember it with great nostalgia and great affection. I mean, from a performer's point of view, a theater of that scale must be an extraordinary place to, to work. Yeah, that's the idea. Somebody was saying, oh, it's much too small. It's, it should be 1,500 seats. Well, I couldn't believe that. It's 850, isn't it? Something like that. Which is a perfect size. You can do musicals and you can do intimate drama. And there you are. You've got it. There's no need to change anything.